This is David Byte, Senior Technical Strategist with SUSE. Today we're going to talk a little about HPC performance tuning. So first, let's look at the agenda. We're going to work on defining what performance is, and perhaps even a little about how to measure it. We're going to talk about how to tune, then we'll talk about some tools, and then we'll dig into a few specifics, some things that might be uh, useful from a rule of thumb point of view to be first things to look at. So what is performance? It really depends on the very particular aspect you're looking at. If we're in storage, you, know, you may be talking about throughput. You may be talking about latency. Understanding what those metrics are and what your workload requires is going to be really critical here because some workloads may require small random I.O. with very low latencies. Others may be simply bulk read, bulk write which is all about throughputs. So really understanding that's very key. And when we talk about HPC, we also need to think in terms of, is this an individual stream that we're concerned about? Or is this many readers and writers, an aggregate number that we need to be worried about? So again, really zeroing in on what is the performance there? When we talk about memory, uh, bandwidth per core, right? That's the way HPC industry likes to look at Memory is how much do we have per core and how much bandwidth do we have per core. When we go to the compute side, instructions per clock cycle, IPCs, flops, floating point operations, those are the things that really matter on the HPC side for compute. And then when we get to the, the transport layer, you know, dealing with network and InfiniBand, you know, what's latency, throughput capabilities, um, how much bandwidth do we have available on the network? Again, really understanding what's important here for your particular environment is key to understanding what you need to tune. So let's talk about the process real quick because this is really important to do the right way. So when we think about how to tune, the first thing you have to do is define the goal. And this goes back to really that what is performance discussion. Understanding, you know, am I trying to get better throughput Am I try, trying to lower latency? Am I trying to service thousands of clients simultaneously with very low latencies, right? Getting that goal very clearly defined is important. Um, another part of defining that goal is to look at that individual goal within the scope of the entire system. Understanding that, okay, if I tune this one very particular aspect, it may actually have a detrimental effect on some other things. So if I tune for very low latencies, I may sacrifice some of the top end throughput that it's capable of and vice versa. So those, those are important to understand. So after you've defined the goal, you have to really, you know, come out with what am I measuring and then what tools and how do I measure it? So this is really thinking in depth about what is an important metric here. When you're tuning for latency, um, throughput, probably isn't as big a concern as is getting the, re the responses back very quickly to the workload, right? So that's determining what to measure. And then you think about the how, the tooling that does that. What, what can I use to test latency? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in just a moment. And then it's incremental in nature. You can't tune 50 different settings at once and expect to come out with a meaningful result, especially if you're really looking at the HPC world where one in 2% makes a big difference, especially when you're in scales of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 or more nodes in a cluster. You know, 1%, that's a pretty big deal in a cluster that size. So it's very important that you do it incrementally and that you measure very carefully between each run. So do a baseline, you measure, repeat, and you keep doing this, measuring every change as it goes through both individually and then start stacking them together to look for detrimental effects where two may be combined. And then obviously document. Document each run um, that you've done, the results of that, so you have a really good basis for comparison. Provides a lot of data to do analysis of later and say, hey, look, you know, these two show a very large increase um, together you know, individually and together they show 
but there's a detrimental effect over on this other aspect that may concern us. So getting very clear documentation so you can repeat the steps, repeat the process, be able to test it, you know, perhaps on different hardware, right? There, there's a bunch of things there to do. Um, and that actually brings up a really good point. When you are measuring performance, you have to make sure you are on like for like hardware. You cannot do an apples and oranges comparison. And apples and oranges can come down to things as simple as having different firmware levels between two different clusters or having a different stepping model of CPU even potentially. You have to make sure you are comparing like for like. You can't take uh, a Xeon Silver and a Xeon Gold and have you know the CPUs, the number of cores turned off on the gold and expect it to perform the same as the silver. That's not a legitimate test. Uh, you also have to make sure if you're comparing operating systems, you know, different distributions perhaps even, what you may have to do is make sure that you're getting the same kernel flags using as near as similar kernel versions as possible. It's not going to be a complete apples to apples. Every distribution compiles kernels differently. So that's really important to understand. You're, you're going to find some differences and it may be things that you didn't think about checking. You know, do I have an older kernel on this machine that may not have all the mitigations for side channel attacks? You know, um, do, do I have a missing kernel flag? Does this one default to THP on while this one doesn't? Th those are a lot of things to think about. So please keep that in mind and really think hard about making sure you're doing an apples to apples comparison when doing comparative performance analysis. So let's jump into the tools. So there's, there's a bunch of tools out there, right? Um, you know, these are a few that I tend to use quite frequently. I do a lot of storage work. So FIO for simulating storage IO patterns. And this allows me to do interesting things. You know, I can test it full out. You know, what can the system do when I'm giving it a hundred percent as fast as it can go? You know, what happens to my latencies, for example? I can also do latency bounded, say, you know, going back to those latency sensitive tests. Hey, I need to see how much I can do and keep it at 10 milliseconds or less latency. I can do that with FIO. Very, very useful tool for things like that. IO stat. Uh, this is good for monitoring on the backside. What's my average IO size? You know, how heavily utilized are my storage devices? Um, you know, that's a measuring tool versus a, a load generation tool. And then from an HPC cluster, obviously, Things like HPL, um, which does you know, the Linpack TPP for, for floating point, um, SREAM, SREAM, for sustainable memory bandwidth. Again, one of those important measures, of how much can we do bandwidth per CPU? What's Because we all know what's advertised, what can we realize in this system? And then what can we tune and how does it affect that, right? So there's, those are just a few of the tools. There's a ton of other tools out there uh, available as well. You know, whether it's VMstat, which I made the list twice, uh, IOTOP, IFTOP, NUMATOP, CPU power, these are all things you should use in your investigations. It's important that you reach out and understand what the tools are. And there are a number of other tools available uh, as well. This is just meant to provide a sampling of the things that you may want to look at and start to understand um, because they're really important. Um, you know, when you get down into specific codes, you're going to be looking a lot more at tools that help you profile the code and where CPU time is spent by particular operations. Um, that's beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about in this session. That is a very important piece of HPC tuning. So let's dig into just a few specifics here. So you should always have the starting point. Of course, we're going to you know, point you at SUSE Linux Enterprise for high performance computing. Uh, this is a product we offer that has some optimized libraries. Um, it comes with a bunch of tools for HPC. Um, so that's, that's always the starting point we recommend. The next thing is update it. Please, please, please make sure you're updating the service pack that you have. The more current you stay, the more optimizations you're going to pull in. You know, as we put in, for example, mitigations for spectrum meltdown, initially there was tremendous performance impact, but those were remediated over time by, you know, uh, more updates to the kernel and uh, firmware updates. And Unicode, you know, there were, there were all kinds of 
firmware and system level hardware updates along the way that have helped remediate some of that and lower that performance delta that was there. And then the other thing I always suggest is to make good use of the SUSE toolchain module. If you're not aware of the toolchain module, this is um, a separate user space compiler. Um, it's a newer version of GCC that we release annually for your SUSE Linux enterprise. So whereas with SLE 12, for example, the system compiler is GCC 4.8, you could get GCC 7 in the toolchain module. Uh, I think we're at GCC 8 today, or maybe 9. You know, these, these are things that move relatively quickly. So you're able to stay up with the latest optimizations for your code that are coming out of the upstream GCC team. So let's talk a little about, you know, how we tune, you know, let's start with the hardware. When we look at the hardware, there's a lot of places to, to really start tweaking. Um, one of the things that I always do first, um, one, when you're benchmarking, you need to get a stable benchmark. And really to do that um, and ensure performance, you want to set the hardware in the, in the BIOS firmware settings to the perf uh, performance bias for power. That disables a lot of the power saving functionality, um, but it also means that you're not scaling frequencies up and down, which can affect the results. Um, it also lowers latencies, so you may find that just doing that gives you a fairly significant boost in some cases. Also from the hardware layout, um, hardware perspective, uh, CPU, is look at the memory layout. Your memory should be divided evenly between both sockets, and it should also fill all the channels. You know, a modern CPU has six channels, for example, uh, two banks per channel. So you have 12 DIMMs per CPU. If you're going to half populate it, make sure it's done evenly in one bank on each channel. Failure to use all the channels is just giving up memory bandwidth. So that's an easy one. Uh, I suspect if you're an HPC experienced person, you already do that uh, because that is a pr pretty fundamental piece of HPC system design. But you know, it's a good thing to check to make sure. Um, when you get to disk, there are a few things you can do. If you're running spinning media, um, caching disk controllers are very helpful. Um, there could be situations where they're not, but in general, uh, I like to have them enabled in the system for a few reasons. One, you can put a load of cache on it, and what it really enables you to do is to take off the peaks of the I.O. where it's not totally stressing out the back end. So you get the writes in. If you have bursty writes, It'll go into cache and destage to disk. But the second it's in that battery back to cache, you get your ACK, your acknowledgement back. So you can continue on uh, with other operations. That's really a key in you know, leveling out that the latency you see from the storage back end. Uh, the other thing around that, as we talked there, is to make sure you're not current always running your disk at 100%. Because if you are, you're losing a lot of uh, time into latencies where you're, you're waiting on I.O. And you can see that in some of the tools we talked about. Uh, now, getting more modern, obviously, if you want performance today, you're talking about NVMe. Or if you're really on the bleeding edge, maybe NVDIMs, um, but primarily NVMe. And with NVMe devices, you know, they come in a lot of form factors, you know, PCIe or U.2. The U.2 seems to be the most prevalent today. It provides you a vehicle to have extremely high performance storage with very low latencies that um, meet the needs of most high performance systems. When we look at uh, NVMe, it's important to make sure that you're matching the device to your IO patterns. If you're going to be doing a lot of writes, make sure that you're fitting within the DWPD, the device writes per day that it's designed for. If you have a read intensive NVMe, you may have a 0.3 DWPD. So if it's one terabyte, it's saying you're expecting to get 300 gigs of writes a day. So it'd be pretty easy to overwhelm that. Whereas a write intensive device is going to be somewhere between uh, seven to 10 usually, or more in the case of some technologies. So at that point, you're at three terabytes of write per day on a 10 DWPD. So again, make sure you're matching those up. Um, and also, when you're doing NVMe, 
Think in terms of how many PCIe lanes that you have available in the system from the CPU. This is an area where you're going to want to get a block diagram of the system and really understand, all right, I have two sockets and they have, say, 64 lanes each, but I'm giving up you know, X number of lanes to I.O., X number of lanes to the network or InfiniBand, and X number of lanes to uh, perhaps my uh, uh, spinning disk that's also on this node, right? So maybe you're down to now you only have 24 lanes. Well, if you need four lanes per NVMe, that means you can get six, right? So keep that in mind. That's, that's a very important thing from a hardware design perspective to not go oversubscribed on your system. When you get to your network, um, think about what you're trying to do, right? And, and how much bandwidth you're trying to shove down the line. So it used to be this wasn't a problem. 10 gig, 40 gig even, wasn't too bad. But now we're talking 100 gig, 200 gig network fabrics and, and beyond. Um, and that's both Ethernet and InfiniBand. When we're talking those data rates, it's really hard for a system to drive that much down the network. So the things you do, you know, there's obvious things on Ethernet like jumbo frames, but in the modern world, we're now looking at things like bifurcated adapters. And by bifurcated, that means we're actually attaching to buses on both sockets in a system so that both can use it to get half the bandwidth at the same time. And that's really um, one of the few ways you're going to be able to get any serious throughput that even approaches what today's modern fabrics are capable of is by making sure that you're balanced across uh, the CPU sockets. And then firmware, obviously make sure the firmware is up to date. You know, go in the firmware, look for performance options, look for performance stealing things that are there. And um, most manufacturers will have HPC performance tuning guides where they will make some recommendations based on the workload uh, requirements, whether it's a latency or throughput um, based application. So check those quite carefully. So when we get into tuning the OS, um, there's a lot of things to look at. You know, if, if you're using Ethernet topologies, look for network issues, buffer overflows, um, soft IRQ uh, misses and things. You know, there's, there's a lot of things there that you can tune. I, I ran across this uh, very much when I was doing some Ceph performance work um, where you would see a, a large number of drop packets um, caused by running out of buffer space. So you increase the buffers and you're in better shape. And buffers are not just in one place on the network. You have before it goes into the network stack, you know, the kernel network stack, before it goes into TCP and, and whatnot. So uh, there's, there's several pieces to adjust there. Um, with some PCIe adapters, uh, you know, in this case, specifically some Mellanox cards, you can actually adjust the PCIe read buffer. And there are advantages that you get there, right? Making sure that you've got um, the maximum settings can actually help with throughput. From a security mitigations, there are environments where it may make sense to discuss disabling security mitigations. This is something you want to undertake very seriously and have a very serious discussion with uh, the security team. Um, in general, this is not something you should just blanketly you know, go out and do a blanket application of because it does expose you. But if you're in a, if you have a cluster that's isolated, if your compute nodes are completely isolated from anything else, this may be viable. But have the discussion with your security team uh, because they may be, you know, they may look at it and say, you know what, that's okay for this cluster environment to do that. From storage, uh, one of my favorite topics, if you're using NVMe, or even caching RAID controllers in many situations, um, enabling multi-queue block I.O. is a huge win. That allows your I.O. scaling to happen on more than just one CPU queue, right? By having multiple cores, you have multiple queues, and your I.O. can scale much more gracefully across those than it can by going on a single uh, core. And then on the network, obviously, more things in Nagel's algorithm can have a detrimental effect. Um, in storage, we almost always turn it off because it does impact the system's ability to drive I.O. So a few specific things to, to check on the system. Look at NUMA. 
Um, by default, SUSE Linux Enterprise comes with NUMA auto-tuning enabled. Many, not all, but many, and maybe even most HPC applications are NUMA aware. Um, certainly the schedulers are NUMA aware in most cases. So it may make sense to disable the NUMA auto-tuning flag. NUMA auto-balancing is how it's called. And you can see this in the SUSE uh, Enterprise Linux tuning guide that's linked at the bottom here. The kernel flag is NUMA balancing equals disabled. Again, check with your applications and the, the workloads you're spinning off to the cluster to make sure that this is not going to cause problems. Again, it goes back to the tuning process. Make a change, test, measure, and compare. Transparent huge pages. Again, this is like NUMA. You would expect most applications that need memory access in the HPC world would be aware of how to make use of huge pages without needing the kernel to interfere. That's not always the case. Um, but for those applications that are able to deal with huge pages natively, disabling THP may be a good option. Again, test, measure, compare. Um, the settings for this are also in the tuning guide for SUSE Linux Enterprise. And then look at your InfiniBand fabric. OFED is the open source. MOFED is the one from Mellanox. Um, we always encourage people to look at the open source, right? Help drive the community forward, you know, put pressure on your vendors to make sure they're con contributing to the open source. But OFED is what we distribute. If you want the Mellanox OFED, that's a vendor specific thing. And yes, they have features uh, in Mellanox OFED that are not in the public OFED. There may be a point in between even that you can use. Maybe you use, run OFED in your environment but use the Mellanox subnet manager so you can enable the bifurcated adapters, for example. There are things like that that you should discuss and consider. Um, but again, it may be worth measuring the performance between the two to see which one provides your applications in your environment with the best. So a few other things, make sure you're using the latest um, OS. Um, that's where you get the new features. You know, definitely recommend the toolchain module like we already talked about. Uh, make sure you specify the right compiler, the GCC 9 or uh, whatever particular version is in the toolchain that you're looking at. And then make sure you're using the best MPI stack. You know, there's, there's a lot available uh, and we ship several different MPIs um, available to you as well as specific vendors. So it may be worth testing, especially if you're standing up a new cluster, if you're an established HPC environment, you probably already have your favorite and have it compiled and you know, set up the way you need it. But if you're doing a new environment, don't just trust that, you know, Impitch is good enough, right? Maybe you need um, something else. So be sure and, you know, take a good look at those. And then look at the virtual memory subsystem. There are some tuning options here that can affect it, you know, swappiness, dirty ratios, um, you know, looking for improving the way the virtual memory subsystem works. Tons and tons of tunables here. Again, it goes back to the test one, measure, compare, and keep going through that with those. Um, there's this link will actually take you where you can see these options. Um, be careful, uh, but you know, you're not, you're probably not going to blow anything up but uh, make sure you know what the defaults are when you get started. And then my favorite topic, tune the storage. HPC clusters can use many different types of storage, but guess what? They all need to be tuned. Um, so make sure, you know, when you deploy that it actually meets your performance requirements. Um, NFS can actually be fine for small clusters. When you get in a large parallel environment, probably not. CephFS, you know, this is new to most people. CephFS actually provides better horizontal scalability according to some research that's been done than things like Lustre. Um, that's using an HDF5 plugin. There's a paper that was done um, 
and it's actually referred to in a session where Darren Swithill and I will be talking about HPC storage. And then keep in mind, most parallel and distributed file systems are very complex. Um, deploying one of these is not something to be lightly undertaken. There's a lot of things to tune and you've got a lot of interactions to consider between the hardware, the OS, the file system you're deploying, the network or, or fabric that you're going across and the client side. So just because something isn't performing well, don't assume that it's the file system. It could be your client system. It could be, you know, one single server node, or it could be something in the fabric itself. So be, be sure and check those very carefully and think about the implications of each. So as we go into wrapping up, I do have one other thought that you may want to think about. And that's when you go into tune and look at performance of your HPC cluster. You should probably benchmark each component, both singularly and then together as you go along. From a storage world, that means if you've got 10 drives in a system, you benchmark each drive, make sure they're all performing at a certain level, and then benchmark them as an aggregate to make sure that you don't have bottlenecks on the bus, right? So that's one thing to keep in mind as you go along. You'll know, build the system up as you benchmark. So in conclusion, lots of tools to use, lots of tunables in the system. Be systematic in your approach. It may seem like it's going to take a long time, but the benefits are worth it to make sure that you're doing things in a way that is incremental and repeatable and documented. Measure, measure, measure. Please don't give up on measuring each and every one of these. And also, be a little wary of the synthetic benchmarks. They may not really represent your environment. You know, even tools like FIO, you can do some really interesting things with mixing IO, but it may not appro uh, appropriately approximate what you really see in your environment. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind. So I hope that this has been helpful. Um, I really think that there's a lot to be gained in performance tuning. And, you know, remind you, we do have another session on talking about HPC storage, as well as plenty of other topics. So thank you and have a great day.